So um, when it comes to uh, understanding the patterns, uh, one thing you do need to understand is the karate has evolved quite a lot over the over time, right? So I think it would be fair to say that nowadays the majority of karateka focus on outfighting other karateka, and that's true of pretty much any martial art you can think of, right? So. You know, boxing, the noble art of self-defense, now just concentrates on beating other boxers. Judo players concentrate on beating other judo players. We have an inward focus. We concentrate on beating our own, right? So if you're sparring with someone from a, you know, a, a, a karate style, typically, you know, we'll have our guards up. We'll be nice and light on our feet. We'll be moving around from there. We'll use feints. We'll use blocks. And there's a lot of back and forth, right? Great. Love all that. Teach all that. Like doing it, right? But if you look at your katas, you don't see guards up and you don't see this kind of footwork. And the reason for that is, they are the skills you would use to duel a fellow martial artist. So it's what I call consensual violence, right? It's when you and another person go, we agree to fight, and this is how we're going to fight, and this is what we determine a win is. Do you know what I mean? So that ranges from every single combat sport in existence to two guys stepping outside of a pub car park, right? It's a consensual violence, you know, it's something people are agreeing to do. And then you've got non-consensual violence, which is when someone tries to inflict violence upon you and you want nothing to do with it, right? So self-defense, if you like. And that is what your, your um, uh, kata focuses on, exclusively. And the reason I know that is because the old masters told us that. Right? So if you look at like Anka Witosu, hugely influential, uh, I'm guessing from the club badges, most of you have shown the kind of background, the vast majority of katas that you practice come via Witosu. And a lot of the ones you practice, like the Hiyans or any kata with a show suffix, uh, 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 Nahanshi Nidan uh, or Teki Nidan, Teki Sandan were all created by Itosu, hugely influential karate, right? And in 1908, he wrote a letter to the uh, um, education authorities of Okinawa to say, This is why you should let me teach karate to school kids. And the reason he did that is because karate was dying out. You know what I mean? There was only a handful of practitioners left, right? So we need to get the youth involved, we need to move, move on. There's a lot of political reasons for that based on the Meiji Restoration and all that. I'm going to leave all that because it's not really relevant for what we're going to talk about. Uh, but, but, but he wrote this, this, this 1908 letter. Uh, many, many years ago, I got a, a book called Karate Do Tai Kan, which was published in the 1930s. There was only 200 or so copies originally published. This isn't an original, it's a copy of one of the books, you know, it was made to look the same way. It cost me about £300 and I got it from uh, a gentleman in Okinawa, right? So he sends me this, right, this, um, uh, this book. The reason I wanted the book was because it has uh, photographs in of this letter. He told you his handwritten letter, right? When I get it, I take photographs of it and I send it to a translation company because I want a translation done of it. They write back to me saying, we can't do it because it's not in modern Japanese, it's in like, a, like an older dialect, you know, our born and bred Japanese language translators couldn't translate this for me. <laughs> I write back and say, look, you know, you, you work in translation, you, you, you stand a better chance of finding someone than me, you know, can you give it a go? So about a month or so later, they write back, oh, it just so happens that one of our translators has a relative in Japan who specialises in these older texts and Okinawa dialect and stuff, we can do it, but it's expensive, uh, do it. By the way, if you want this translation, it's on my website for free, but it cost me a lot of money <laughs> to get it done. Uh, uh, um, so I eventually get it done. And the reason I wanted it done this way is there are translations of Itosu's letter all over the internet, but the, 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 if a professional translator is telling me he's struggling to do it, how accurate is one going to be done by some black belt in a dojo? Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You know, so I, I, I wanted one done. And I also wanted done, one done by someone who wasn't a martial artist. Because I've read others and I go, I know who translated this. And I can see their thinking layered onto everything. They've translated it through the lens of their own thought. Which, I mean, it's hard not to do, right? So anyway, I, I, I get a copy of this letter. And this bit is what I call the most important sentence in the history of karate, right? I paid about 500 quid for it. It's stuck in my brain forever. Uh, but this is the, uh, the second sentence of his first precept, right? And this is really important for everything we're going to do today. Karate is not intended to be used against a single adversary. It is a method of avoiding injury by using the hands and feet should one by chance be confronted by a villain or ruffian. Right? That, that's how it was translated for me, right? In slightly clearer English, maybe. Uh, karate is not intended for use against a single adversary. It is not for consensual violence. You know, you and me, one person, we agree to fight. It's a method of avoiding injury. So not winning necessarily, just keeping yourself safe, right? By using the hands and feet, obvious. Uh, should one by chance be confronted by a villain or ruffian, criminal, 
So what it's also saying there, right at the start of his 10 precepts, the karate of his time, the karate of the katas, is not for a consensual duel against another martial artist, it's for keeping yourself safe from criminal behavior. Is, is that okay? And if you view the kata in that context, it makes perfect sense. The trouble is we have today is most don't. So you have one guy standing in the middle, and you have people around him in very formal karate poses, ready to attack in very formal karate ways. The thinking of it is karate versus karate, and that's incorrect. You know what I mean? Historically, it's incorrect. Itosu wasn't alone in saying that either. Motobu, and trained under Itosu, not until he got kicked out of Itosu's dojo, another story. <laughs> but he, tra he trained under Itosu, but Motobu, who, was, who believed that you know, uh, karate should be a, a, a self-defense art first and foremost, nothing is more harmful to mankind than a martial art that can't be used in self-defense, he said. He wanted to keep it pure, which is why he would never reach the levels of popularity as those who were prepared to make it more modern, right? But he said, he says, we must understand the techniques of the karate have their, uh, the techniques of the kata have their limits. They were never intended to be used against a warrior on a battlefield or an athlete, uh, and, or an athlete in an arena. They are, however, extremely effective against someone who has no idea of the defensive strategy being used against them. You know, so they are effective against other non karate but they're not for samurai's fight on a battlefield, and it's not for two athletes in an arena, a consensual fight. Is everyone okay, okay with that one? Yeah. Dave, can you just worry for one second? I've lost him. There he is. <laughs> so I need to explain all this, because then you've got the context, and then we can get running with some actual techniques, right? So if me and Dave were to spar, and this is true for anyone else in this room, right? Uh, I would probably want to start somewhere about this far apart, because I'm knowing. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be close enough where I could get in. You know, well, not, there's normally a show of respect, you wouldn't get that in self-defense, right? We may even tap up a little bit, you know, the western one as well. And then we'll start, so we'll have our guards up and we'll move, we'll be nice and light and feet. And I'll throw some techniques at Dave, and Dave will throw some techniques at me, and we'll just kind of move around. And great, loads of fun, love doing all that, right? Never ever seen self-defense work like that. No, excuse me, do you mind if I mug you? <laughs> okay, you ready? Let's go. First one to eight points, great, let's go. You know, they, 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 it's not going to happen that way, it's got to be an arm's length. With a, with a great show of disrespect and not with compatible techniques. Right, so if I'm this far apart, if, if anything, and this is true of all of you, right? So if you imagine I was sparring with you now and you saw me go like that, what am I about to do? <laughs> you know, that's a gakazuki. Yeah, because I've seen a billion of them. Right, so this I go, eh, you know. And because you're that far apart, you've got the room to react to that. Is that okay? I know what he's doing, it instantly twitches. I'm already starting to drop my arm, the, t the space gives me the time, I can effectively block and I can effectively count. Is, is that okay? Self-defense wise, you're this far apart with a non karateka who doesn't have the same skill set as you and therefore his movements are not recognizable. I'm just gonna swing punches in front of your face, I'm not gonna make contact, I hope. <laughs> so so self-defense wise, it's how many of those you're gonna spot? If you're lucky enough to block the first one, the next three have eaten you. Do you know what I mean? Because they're just going to try and overwhelm you with the violence instead, right? So it's, it's, it's a very different skill set. And one of the big problems we've got today is everything gets reinterpreted as blocking. But, but self-defense wise, you need to practice blocking, obviously. No one wants a punch hurt them towards the face going, I wish I'd practiced stopping that. <laughs> you know, but but, but um, uh, the, the reality of it is you will not block very much at close range. Do you know what I mean? So what you want to do is you need to be able to get them in a position that limits their ability to throw shots in the first place. You know, that, if that doesn't make sense, it will before we're finished. But as karate evolved to be a modern budo, uh, uh, like uh, with the aim being to produce fit young recruits for the military, essentially, the aim to be physical conditioning and discipline, and there's loads of military stuff we do all the time. What was the first thing we did when we did it today? We line up by rank and we stand there like that. <laughs> They never did that in Okinawa, they did that in Japan, because the idea is our military's way behind the West, we need to expand it rapidly, everyone lines up by rank. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's preparation for military training, and we've just carried on doing it. Right? So, so what we're going to be looking at is a, a close range. Everything we're going to do is a close range against someone who may be an extremely skilled and competent criminal, but may, may not necessarily hold a black belt in any martial art at all. He's okay, and I'll just on this and then we'll get the first technique. Sometimes uh, uh, people think, oh yeah, but if he's not trained, he can't be very good, right? That, that's a huge bit of martial arts arrogance, and I see it everywhere. You know, where, where people go, um, oh yeah, that might work against someone who's untrained, but against a trained person. Well, it depends on the context. I'll give you an example, a friend of mine, like, and, and by his own admission, in his youth he was a lunatic. 
You know, you know what I mean? I'm constantly getting into fights, all the single time. I remember having this conversation with him. You know, you'd have three fights every weekend, there's a minimum. You know, the fear is a re local reputation. Yeah, you don't want to mess with that guy. He's really a competent fighter. I remember talking with him once, he says, you know, about these fights, and he says that this was the plan. He goes, I while we were still talking or arguing, I'd hit them with my right hand. So he'd try and hit them when they weren't ready, because if they were still standing, I'd grab them and headbutt them. If they were still standing, I'd run away. <laughs> what, would, what would his cat look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's everything he knew. Uh, but he's extremely skilled in that environment. You know what I mean? I, I, I always use the analogy of, like, you think of lions and sharks. Yeah, if I'm on you know, the African plains, you know, I don't want to come across a lion because it's its environment. But if there's a shark flapping about dying on the... I don't care about that. <laughs> Likewise, you know, if I'm in the middle of the ocean and I see a lion drowning, I'm not really concerned. Because when you change the context, everything else changes with it. Is that all right? So, so self-defense-wise, may, you, may, you may beat them all day every day on a mat or in a ring or in a cage or whatever. But you put them in their context, they can be the apex predators. Is that okay? And that's who we look at when we deal with cat. And if you view cat from the perspective of civilian self-defense, it makes a lot of sense. If you view it from the perspective of two martial artists dueling, it makes no sense because it was never designed for that. I always say, like trying to apply the techniques of the cat and all fight each other, it is like trying to knock a nail in with a paintbrush and then complaining paintbrushes don't work. You know, you're using it for the wrong thing. You know what I mean? You're using it for the right thing. You go, yeah, it works. It works before it's designed for. That okay? Yeah. Everyone got the context? Right, great. So that footage was taken from a four-hour seminar I taught. So obviously there's a lot more information that isn't going to be shared in this, uh, this video. But that uh, premise is really important to understand. You are not going to understand the solution, the methods of the kata, if you don't understand the problem. And uh, uh, consensual violence and non-consensual violence are, are very different. If you look at the kata from the perspective of how do I outfight another martial artist in a consensual exchange? It's it's doomed to failure. You'll never get anywhere with that. You need to understand the nature of non-consensual criminal violence, in which case the cat that makes a lot more sense. Now, there's a lot to this that we that, that we then went on to discuss. But here's some key things I think I need to add to the end of this video to add that sense of completeness. Right? It's not just about training. Uh, you know, the level of training someone's got because a criminal often has a great deal of real life experience. You know, they are trained in their own way. Uh, it's not just about, you know, well, in the rules, you can't do this. That's not it either. It, it's a fundamental difference. The goal will determine the strategies you use to achieve that goal. The strategy will determine the tactics you use. The tactics will determine the choice of techniques, right? That's just the way it works. If you change the goal, everything else changes with it. So if your aim, your goal, is to outfight someone in a fight you've agreed to, in a way you've agreed to, where you've got symmetrical goals, that will create a, a certain style of, of, of violence, right? Consensual violence. However, for self-defense, the criminal's aim is to harm you in some way for their own advantage or pleasure, right? Your aim is not to get harmed. So therefore, it's different. You have asymmetrical goals. You do not have the same goal as them. For the criminal's perspective, it's not in their best interest to try and outfight you in order to get what they want from you. Right? That's a, a very bad way for them to get it. They are far better trying to overwhelm you with violence, right? And by counter to that, what we need to do is make sure that we can overwhelm them with our violence in such a point where they are disorientated or disabled enough that escape is possible. Because our aim isn't to win, our aim is to avoid harm. And unfortunately, most people either don't understand the big differences or, or they don't want to know about the big differences because they find it as, as, as inconvenient. Uh, but when you, you do understand the nature of non-consensual criminal violence correctly, the methods of the cutters start to make a great deal of, of sense. We don't see a lot of reactive techniques. Uh, because, you know, he does, you do. Because as I talked about in there, you don't have the, the, the time because you haven't got the room and you don't have the consensual uh, or, or common skill sets that enables you to pick up on techniques very early, right? They, they don't throw a few, move off, throw a few, move off. It's not the way it works. There'll be swinging shots at about a rate of around four a second, right? It's at the limits of human reaction speed. It, it, it is very different. And one thing I'd, I'd like to finally make clear as well is this isn't saying that one is better or worse than the other, right? It's appropriate and inappropriate. Later on in the seminar, I talked about, you know, it's like having a toolkit. You take out the right tool for the job. 
So in my dojo, we like to practice consensual fighting skills. How do we outfight one another? It's something we like doing, we find it enjoyable, we get a great deal of value out of it. But we know that those skills aren't relevant for the self-defense side of things, right? We employ, we have a different goal. So it's different strategies, different tactics, and a different choice of, uh, of technique. Now, obviously, I can't explain all of that in this video, but it's fundamental that you get that premise. And when you start along that path, the kata starts to make a great deal uh, more sensitive than it would otherwise. The methods within the kata are a very good fit, when correctly understood, uh, for uh, non-consensual criminal violence. We'll